We're going to pray just for some needs um, before I just share. Um, Shelley Graham had just phoned up this morning. She has knee and hip problem. We're going to pray for Kay. We're going to pray for our Thai team that I understand is in Chiang Mai still, up in the northern part. Oh, they're back in, in, in Bangkok. All right. And uh, going to pray for our council. Um, I went to the last Ipswich City Council meeting. It was very interesting. <laughs> very interesting. Um, the council we had was fairly toxic toward each other. They were not very nice. And um, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know how it's all going to finish up. Um, I had just looked up in our, our division and um, Andrew Antonelli, a former mayor, who um, after all he went through when the state government, uh, what would be the word, fired our council, and after multiple court cases, the judge had said they did, they did not have a right to do that. And um, Andrew, as is, we will have two councillors for Division 3, and he is about 30 votes behind the second top voting councillor. Um, in between time, Andrew, Andrew's marriage broke up because of all that pressure and stress. And then he came to Christ in the midst of it. Has been water baptised and is fellowshipping with Catalyst Church and has been for the last couple of years. Quite amazing. He would, anyway, we'll pray. So, Father, we do lift to you these various needs. We lift Shelley to you that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, your spirit would touch her and would bring healing um, into the knee, into the hip. Father, we bring Kay to you that uh, even now that you would keep her in a cocoon, as it were, but, Father, that even in the midst of that, the uh, Holy Spirit would touch and heal. Heal her, Lord God, cause her hope, uh, even as was touched on by Isabel this morning, cause her hope to be so firmly in you that touch that mortal body by the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus, we pray. And, Father, we do pray for our Thai team back in Bangkok, for your spirit to um, touch Elizabeth and touch Karen. Father, give them rest, uh, protect them in terms of the foods they eat and the impact of those foods on their body. Father, touch their bodies. They have uh, both experienced um, aches and pains and various things, so we pray, touch them, Lord God, and, and lift them up uh, in a, a most amazing way. And Father, we do pray for the council that even uh, as today voting goes on, we know that um, Therese Harding has come back as our mayor and we know that she's very open to Christian things. She has instigated praying, uh, having someone pray publicly before every council meeting. And Father, we do look to you by your spirit to enable her. And Father, just with the other councillors as voting goes on today, that you would cause their hearts to turn to you. And Father, that um, there would be different ones who would, um, even if for the wrong <laughs> reasons, they'd be praying today. They may have hardly ever prayed in their entire life. But Father, that you turn their hearts to yourself in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 So I'd like to speak today on a probably twin theme to what I talked about last Sunday. And uh, I probably would do well to have another pair of eyes. And I'd like to talk about fulfilling your royal calling. I would not be so game as to say, do you remember what I spoke about last week? I, I just picture in my mind a clip that uh, went around the world of a church in Africa that's led by a man who calls himself a bishop and he literally smacks people with a wooden cane who cannot remember what he preached on the week before. <laughs> He's been filmed doing it, and the film's gone around the world. I've seen it numerous times and thought, there but for the grace of God go I. <laughs> Fulfilling your royal calling. I'd like to tell you a story. It'll be our next slide. This is part of Newcastle. It's called the Bogey Hall. It's a natural formation. And uh, this, this, um, this picture would have been taken probably uh, between low and uh, high tide. But in... In high tide, the uh, waves crashed right over that uh, rock rock section and um, into the pool. Uh, you can see on the, on the right-hand side down the bottom, steps, because it's, a, uh, it's a, a place where people love to 
to go to go swimming. Uh, there have been deaths there, unfortunately. But um, this story goes back a few years. I was not amongst this group, but I have a number of friends who, who were. They were going to water baptize uh, a number of fairly new converts. And uh, they said, let's go to the bogey hole and, and, and do it. So they went to the bogey hole, but they found that there had been uh, storms and, and the, the, wa- the waves were just smashing over that rock face into the pool. And it actually made it probably quite, quite dangerous. No one else was swimming uh, there because of that. And the um, leader of that group, uh, John, looked at it, put his arms up in the air and said, in Jesus Christ's name, be still. And they said, as they watched, these waves just literally over a second went down perfectly flat. They water baptised those who were being water baptised and as they came out of the water, the waves just began to crash up again. It was quite extraordinary. I've, I've talked with numerous people who were there on that day and saw this happen. I want to come back to a, a scripture that uh, would be known to many of you, to Genesis chapter 1, and I'm reading from verses 27 and 28. And 27 said this, says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, Male and female, he created them. Um, My understanding of um, image and likeness, uh, although they are are two words very, very similar, uh, and my understanding is that it would mean that he created humanity uh, with a spiritual ability to communicate with him, not given to anything else, any other part of creation. So they could have, humanity could have a relationship with him, and out of that relationship could grow in God-likeness. There was a sense in which perhaps um, uh, initially there was like a, a moral new, neutrality, but then they could, they could grow um, into God-likeness. So being created in his image and his likeness, just expressing that first of all. Right, verse 28 says, So God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful, increase in numbers, uh, fill the earth and subdue it. Now, I want you to catch this next word, rule, over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over every living creature that moves on the ground. The word rule. God gave to the first um, humans here on earth a command and a privilege that they would rule, and they would rule the earth. Now, when I looked at this word rule, I found that the um, Hebrew word from our Old Testament is never used of God's rule. It's only ever used of human rule, And that gives me a a bit of a clue that I have to be careful to avoid a teaching that became a bit popular a number of years back called the little gods teaching. That there's one great God and because he's given us his authority to rule, we are like little gods so we can can do whatever we like. We can just express that in an independent way of him. It was a hyper-faith teaching and and, um, it has thankfully, just sort of disappeared now. So I, I just see there that when, when God is trying to express what, what his rule looks like, he does not give the same authority to rule that he has fully in that way to human beings here on earth. He remains God. He's God and we are humanity, but he gave to them a certain measure to rule. So uh, I think this is our next slide. God's initial desire was to give humanity authority to rule, not independently of him, but under him. You understand that? So, so God is building a picture of what this rule will look like. Um, next thing I found when I looked at this word rule, it can have one of two meanings. It can mean to rule or it can mean to tread. To tread. Well, that seems funny that you'd have... A, a word that can mean rule and a word that can mean tread. But then I began to think of the number of times where um, in the Old Testament God said that the land on which you tread, you will rule over. And I, I just, I've got oh, Joshua 1.3. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given to you. Just as I spoke to Moses and that, that is repeated numerous times in the Old Testament. How many of you have ever done prayer walks? All right, some of you did. uh, Again, they don't seem to be very popular right now. 
I remember many years back we had a, uh, a series of prayer walks around here. And um, someone, I think they were in our church at this time, they said, oh, you all looked a little bit funny walking up and down the street here because you're all calling out something and it just looked a little bit funny, all right? But what we were doing, we were, we were taking the ground and we were following this principle that this word rule and this word tread, uh, the same Hebrew word covered both. And, and we were claiming that where we, where we trod, where we went, that, that we were claiming that, that area. All right? Uh, verse 28, I just want to read it again, and I think it's the next slide. Oh, there it is there. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. So I began to look at this word subdue. To my surprise, this word meant to tread down with force. It meant to bring into submission forcibly. Completely different word to the word rule. Completely different word. And I began to think about this. I thought, but, you know, God gave Adam and Eve the authority to rule, but yet when they subdued the earth, it was to force the earth as it were. And I thought, wouldn't it be easy? Because sin sin hadn't entered into the world. But then when I looked at the way this word was used through the rest of the Old Testament, I discovered something. And let me just read to you a scripture from Numbers 32. And um, in this, in this passage, um, Moses, now um, some of you would know all this, but when the children of, of Israel went into the promised land, three tribes, um, Reuben, Gad, Manasseh, Manasseh was... Uh, The three wanted to be outside of the area that that God was saying, this is the land that I am giving you. Actually, Manasseh was partly in and partly out, but um, like a lot of Christians. Um, But this is the context. And and, uh, so the uh, three tribes are saying, we actually, we, we want to be just on the outside of the land. And then Moses is trying to work with this. And this is what he says in Numbers 32. He said, And if all of you who are armed, meaning Reuben, Gad, Manasseh, cross over the Jordan before the Lord until he's driven his enemies out before him, then when the land is subdued, there's our word again, so forcibly trodden under before the Lord, you may return and be free from your obligation to the Lord and to Israel. And this land will be your possession before the Lord. So, so. The way that it's used here, and I think this is our next slide, God would drive their enemies out, but they had to subdue the land to make it theirs. See, because when I think of the whole realm of spiritual warfare, um, there are two extremes. Down one side are people who don't want to be part of it. Oh, yeah, it's kind of scary stuff. And, you know, God's he's God. He's amazing God. We don't have to do any any of that stuff. And you've probably had or come across people like that. You may have even even experience stuff like that. Just reading through the book of Acts, John Mark, uh, we go through Cyprus with um, uh, Paul and Barnabas and they have times of spiritual warfare and John Mark said, whoa, I'm going back to mummy. And that's exactly what he did. He went back to mama um, because he, he found it too much. Up the other end are, are people who are just, everything is spiritual warfare. Everything is trial, everything is hard, everything is push, push, push. It's so hard, but it's the Christian life. We've got to make it to the end. Well, how many know both sides have a measure of truth to them? But see, I find here God said, you take the land, I'll drive them out, but you must subdue them under your feet. So God said, I'll do something, but you have to follow with me. This is how it works. So, so subduing uh, means that, that God will give you an authority, but you have to walk in that authority. You have to do something. And sometimes it will be hard. And, and that's why it said you've got to subdue the land. There's, there's something forcible in that. Thinking of the scripture in Matthew 11, 32, somewhere around there, where the Lord Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. And what's the, the next part? And the violent take it by force. The violent take it by force. So, so if we're going to, to walk in what it means to rule as, as part of uh, being part of the royal family and, and walk and fulfill our royal calling, it will mean learning to, to tread underfoot the enemy. And God will have already given us authority, but we have to walk in it. 
We have to walk in it. <laughs> Is that okay? Well, it's true anyway, even if you don't think it's okay. <laughs> so, now this was all before the fall, but did the fall change all that? Did everything turn around with, with the uh, fall? So, so let me come back to, again to the scripture that we uh, started with last week, and you will remember that because... <laughs> Because if you were in, in Africa, you'd be in real trouble if you didn't. Exodus chapter 19, third month. Um, children of Israel have come to Mount Sinai. And they have come to the mountain and Moses has gone up on the mountain and God is speaking to them. Uh, verse 3, Moses went up to God. Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob, what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Next slide, I think it is. So all that God does is to bring you to himself. You understand that. It's not to bring you necessarily into ministry, not to bring you into, it, not even to, br to bring you to church. God forgive me, John, if you're watching this. But ultimately, God brings you to himself. And then when we come to him, he puts us into family. Psalm 68. The solitary he puts in family. All right, so, so everything he does is to bring us to himself. And then the next part. And then he says to Israel, verse 5, if you obey me, fully keep my covenant. Out of, now, so it's conditional promise. If, if you obey me, if you fully... Keep my covenant. Then out of all the nations, you'll be a treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you'll be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. A kingdom of priests and a holy nation. I did talk last week about what it meant to fulfill our priestly calling. But here he said, we are not just priests before God. We are a kingdom. We have royal authority. There is an authority to rule. And when I was reading about this, I, I came across uh, just an amazing little truth, which is up there. It says this, In the ancient Near East at this time, a people could be considered free from the rule of a king if they placed themselves directly under the authority of God. They became a kingdom in their own right. All right, and this was from a... Um, uh, IVP background commentary, good, solid, evangelical study and theology. And so God was saying that you will not be under a human king, you will be a kingdom because you'll be under me. You'll be under me. You're under the king of kings, you're under God Almighty. So you will be a kingdom unto me. Now we come to the New Testament. So was there a repeat of this of this um, uh, unction that God gave to be, to be ruling. Revelation 1, verses 5 and 6. To him who loves us, has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. He has made us to be a kingdom. He's not only given you priestly authority, he's given you royal authority to rule. He wants you as a Christian to exercise a level of rulership in your life and over the world and over the life around you. Our next slide is a picture of uh, Catherine Kuhlman. Now, Catherine Kuhlman's name isn't, isn't even known by so many Christians today. But I, I think how in the um, early stages of um, when I was baptized in the, in the Spirit, in the in a Pentecostal church, we used to go back on a Sunday night to um, someone's home. We'd, we'd go Sunday morning, Sunday night to the meetings. Then we, we'd go back and we would watch films, uh, literally the old films, the what are the eight, eight millimeter films, like, you know, reel to reel films. And, and uh, we would watch films of Catherine Kuhlman meetings, of Jack Coe meetings, A.A. Allen, Ola Roberts, and we would be utterly amazed at the, at the healing crusades because the miracles were so obvious. I, I can still remember seeing um, Owen Roberts praying for a man that now, is it called uh, a goita? On the, and, and the man's like this because the swelling is right out here. And, 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 you, and they, they don't break 
like the film, they're filming while Roberts puts his hand on that goiter and just prays, and you watch the hand, old Roberts' hand, go all the way down, and you watch the man, <laughs> and the goiter has disappeared over seconds. And we would watch this stuff on a, on a Sunday night. And the Catherine Kuhlman meetings, she probably saw more people healed in America anyway than any other evangelist in that day. She could have thousands in a single meeting healed. Quite staggering. But I would hear over and over and over. And you, you understand, America back then was a lot more Christianized than it is now and far more Christianized than Australia is, I can assure you. And when she would pray with people, she, and they'd be remarkably healed, she would often, often say to them, I've got to not use her, her voice. She had a particular way of talking. And, uh, anyway, she would say to them, how long has it been since you've been in church life? Or since you've been to church, I think she, she'd say back then. And the number of times I'd say, oh, 25 years, or 30 years, or 45 years. And she'd say over and over, oh, the mercy of God. The mercy of God. Because, you know, we would think, oh, I can't be prayed for because I'm not really good enough. You know, I, 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 I gossip, I, I swear, I do this, I do that, or something else. And, and she saw the mercy of God poured out, the power of God poured out because God is a merciful God. And she knew that as a conduit, as, uh, when she'd, she'd pray for people, she knew the same mercy of God that touched them had already touched her. The mercy of God, the mercy of God. Let me come to um, Ephesians chapter 1, and, and this will be the, uh, just the next and final section, though it's a bit long. <laughs> Sorry. Ephesians chapter 1, and, and I'm reading from verse 18, and Paul is, Paul is praying for a church that has been steeped, so Paul is praying for the church in a city that is steeped in witchcraft. And, and you, you need to know that. And Paul knew that the church in Ephesus needed to know the power of God because they saw the power of God demonstrated around them. They saw demonic miracles happening around them. If you know your church background a bit, the only time when Paul said, I despaired of life, in 2 Corinthians 1, he is in jail in Ephesus. And, and he is being bombarded by demonic thoughts and demonic powers because he is in a city that is steeped in idolatry, um, steeped in witchcraft. So he knew that the church he's praying for needed three particular things. I'm reading from verse 18. Uh, chapter 1, verse 18. I pray, the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know. Now the first one, that you may know the hope to which he has called you. And this was again alluded to earlier when um, Isabel led us in communion. The hope. In the New Testament, the hope is always future. It's always looking towards something. Um, hope is in the mind. Um, faith is in the heart. But um, faith and hope, will, faith, hope and love will be the, the three that Paul will pick up in 1 Corinthians 13. So uh, it, it carries a sense of confident expectation of good. Um, almost always in the New Testament, it has a heavenly look to it. Almost always. Now, when we use the word hope, is it a very strong word? <laughs> hope it doesn't rain today. Well, is that a very strong? No, no. But the, but the Bible word is a very strong word. It's a very, very strong word, looking ahead that with confident expectation. And so I, I love the way Isabel projected it this morning. It's a confident expectation that, that when this life ends, we will be with him immediately. Um, we sent a, a, a little clip over to a family in Uganda um, a couple of days back. Uh, last week I asked Teresa if I can share one or two stories. She would have said no. So this time I'm not looking at her. I'm looking away. I think this one's okay. So we sent... I think she still would have stopped me telling the story I was going to tell, though. I'll tell that story another time when she's not here. We sent this clip over. Just 
um, because this family that we are involved with in, um, you know, we've always called it Kampala. Now we hear that it's actually called by people in Uganda, they call it Kampala. Have you ever heard it called Kampala? No. All right. Kampala. So we send this clip over and the, and the wife, uh, I forget her actual wording, but it was something like, oh, Papa, that's me, you are so old. <laughs> and, and she didn't say it, but something like, and you're still able to walk. Like, you know, like, or something like, like that. I thought, oh, all right, well, I was feeling pretty good till then, but <laughs> I'd say the average age of dying in Uganda is considerably less than over, over here. In uh, India, it is 10 years under the Australian one. Full 10 years under. I got that from Sheikha. All right, so, so I have this absolute certainty that if my life were to end here and now, I would instantly be with him, with the Lord Jesus. Instantly, I would suddenly see an angel who had been waiting and that angel would take me up to be in heaven instantly. And, and then when the Lord Jesus comes back, I would have a glorified body. And that's really good because I'm not real keen on this one right now. So, but, but this is the hope we have. And this is what Paul wanted the church to know that, that the battles that we're going through right now are nothing to be compared to the glory that's going to be shown to them. And that's what he said in Romans 8. I believe the suffering you're going through right now is nothing to be compared to the glory that's going to be shown to you. Absolute glory, wonder. Next thing, he uh, uh, prays for them in verse, what verse are we in? 18. He said that you would know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Put up your hand if you're a saint. Put up your hand if you ain't a saint. I mean, you know, lots of Christians think, oh, no, I could never put up my hand and say I'm a saint. Yes, you can. If you have put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then the scripture says you're a saint. Put up your hand if you're a saint. Oh, there are even more, more hands went up. <laughs> See, so the riches of his glorious inheritance is in us now, is in the saints. Not that they will have it some future time. They have it now. I remember years back uh, when, when I, I, I really wanted to mark different things in my, in my Bible. Like I, you know, I had different subjects, I wanted to, to have colours, but my uh, Bible was too holy for that. So I got uh, one not quite as holy that I could mark. And, and it had bigger print too. And, and, and then I had a whole series of colours. I had my coloured pencils and, and, and I just marked it, marked it, marked it. But I had a colour, a uh, brown was my colour for promises. And if it, if it was talking about who I am in Christ, I would put a mark down, down the margin. And, and I was struck by how many times the scripture talks about the amazing inheritance that he has already given to us. Not that we will one day have, but we have right now. And, and um, I don't have that uh, Bible now, um, but... And I, and I don't really want to mark the ones that I've got right now. <laughs> These ones are really holy right now. <laughs> and they're really expensive. <laughs> Most of them have, have are stuck together by sellotape because the outward part falls apart very, very quickly. A bit like me, actually. I often, often thought this. The inward part's not doing too bad, but the, the outward part's stuck together by sellotape. Anyway, all right. Let's not take that any further. The next part. Verse uh, 19, and this is the one I want to really touch on. So Paul is praying that you will know three things. This is the third one. His incomparably great power for us who believe. His incomparably great power. Not just great power, incomparably. There is nothing he could compare to this amazing power. Now the NIV goes on to, to say, oh, that power is like the working of his strength. But every other version I looked at said it is the same power, not just like. And, and they're, they're trying to translate a, a word that, that can mean oh, in this way or um, in like manner. And, and it can mean you can go that way or you can go that way. NIV went that way. I like the versions that went that way. 
because they say it's the same power. The same power for us who believe is the same power that raised Christ from the dead. And that's what, what he will then go on to, uh, to, to say, that power, um, the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. I want to know that the power of God that is vested in me as a human being is the same power that raised Christ from the dead. That's what most of the versions, um, um, NIV, and I love NIV in lots of ways, I just think they, they kind of soft pedal with that one a bit. It's the same power. Um, next slide, I think it is. So Paul was adamant Christ's death was the ultimate measure of the love of God. There's no greater measure of the love of God than the cross. But Paul was also adamant that the resurrection power of God is the ultimate measure of the power of God. There is no greater measure of the power of God than the resurrection power of Christ. That's the power of Christ that is in us now. And so Paul is praying for this church. He wants the, the church in Ephesus to know the power of God. He wants them to know the power of God. I think it's the next slide. I just can't tell from my notes. Oh, no, it's not. My mistake. Go on back. <laughs> so he wants them to know. I've already said the church in Ephesus was a, the um, city was steeped in uh, witchcraft. Um, and so Paul, he wanted this church to know that, that you might have demonic powers working around you, but you have the power of God inside you. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is the power of God in a believer. And Paul said, it's not that you don't have it, it's that you don't know it. Think of this scripture that says, my, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. We simply don't know. We simply don't know that it's ours. My, um, Hosea chapter 4 verse 6. I remember the first time that I experienced healing and um, as I said last week, the longer you stay in this church, you hear all the, all the stories over and over and over. I had not long been in a Pentecostal church. I had a friend in Sydney who had been like me, brought up in a denominational church who's coming up to stay with me and, and I said, I'd like to take you to the church that I'm now going to. Now, I had been, um, I'd just been doing, uh, I've, I've been fasting. The first time I'd ever, ever fasted because I, I really believe, I just read Late Great Planet Earth and all these other enlightening books that I now think is so wrong. But anyway, and I was really thinking, Jesus is coming back at any moment. Why would I want to finish a, a university degree? What a waste of time. Because Jesus will come back. And, and so I'm, I'm praying, say, God, I need to know, do I go back to university or not? And then I, I began fasting, saying, because God, you're not speaking to me. And then my friend came up and I thought, ah, oh, and he looked in the fridge and being typical of a guy who lives by himself, how much food is in the fridge? <laughs> well, nothing except a bit of greenery and it wasn't vegetable. So he's there on Sunday morning and he said, I'm going to go out and buy fish and chips. Yeah, all right. So he goes out and buys fish and chips. So my first meal is fish and chips. I haven't eaten for a couple of days. And um, we go to the meeting and as the meeting went on, I didn't feel very well. And as the meeting went on further, I felt even more unwell. And I just wanted to go home as quickly as possible. And going home, I was very sick. On the way home, it really embarrassed him. At least I got out of the car before I was very sick. And so when we got home, I have severe stomach cramps. I mean, man alive. I've never had diverticulitis or some of these other very painful conditions. But, but I was just in such pain. And then he must have, my friend Alan, must have thought I was delirious because I'm saying over and over, by Jesus' stripes I'm healed. By Jesus' stripes I'm healed. I was thinking, about, you know, who do I phone? Do I phone a number? What? Well, back then we didn't have mobile phones, but, but I'm just saying this and saying this for about three minutes. I'm saying, by Jesus' stripes I'm healed. By Jesus' stripes I'm healed. And then over about 30 seconds I was. The cramps got less and less and they, they completely stopped. And I got up and he said, what happened? And I said, Jesus healed me. Oh, all right. 
So we, we went along that night to the Pentecostal church and he got gloriously baptized in the Holy Spirit. Um, he didn't last long in that denominational church and then he went on and, and went to the AIG Bible College after that, sometime later. Let's go to our next slide. Uh, this is our, our, our last scripture. Romans 5 and verse 17. For if by the trespass of one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Reign in life. This is a royal term, to reign in life. So when Paul is writing to the church in Rome, he's wanting them to know you have received uh, the, the uh, abundant provision of grace, the gift of righteousness working in your life so you can reign in life through the Lord Jesus Christ. How many know there are times when we feel we're under the circumstances? I knew of a preacher years back when someone said, oh, under the circumstances, he'd say over and over, what are you doing under there? Because he knew that the provision was that we would reign. We would not be under, but we would be, we would be over. All right, we'll just move on to the last slide. Some of you may never see one of these. This is called a safety deposit box. I've never seen one in the natural. Um, for obvious reason, I've never had anything needed to go into one. But as you can see, there are two keys. You see, there are two keys. And normally, the bank will have one key. And the owner of the box will have another key. And I want you to imagine that all the great provision of God for you is in a safety deposit box with your name on it. God says, my key are my promises in the Bible. Your key is your faith to take hold of my promises and together as we turn those keys, there'll be a release of all the things that the scripture promises. My promises and your faith. Let me close with a story. I'm just seeing where the, where the water is. I always pick stories that I can't finish. A woman stood outside a meeting. She wanted to go in, but she'd never been to a Pentecostal church. And she was quite reticent. She'd been diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. She'd been told that she'd be in a wheelchair. She'd been told that her life would be shortened. Their family had purchased a home that was on completely flat level ground, so there would be no steps. Someone from this church, and you know who you are because you're nudging the person next to you, someone from this church went up to that, that woman and encouraged her to come on in. Did you sit with her, Joy, or you just encouraged her to go in? Joy hasn't stopped, has she? <laughs> that night, that woman received Christ. And then, when she was prayed for, the Spirit of God touched her. Now, back in those days, it was not uncommon for people to, to fall when they were prayed for. It's very uncommon now. But the person behind her was not expecting her to be hit with such force. And she was hit with such force that she not only hit the ground, but, she, but the person behind her, a man, a solid man, was thrown down and people behind him were knocked over. It was quite dramatic. In that moment or very soon after, she was completely healed of rheumatoid arthritis. Completely healed. She had a certificate. In fact, I don't know where it is now, but I've seen it. I think Teresa's got it. She had a certificate by her specialist who said, he said, well, all I can say is it's gone into remission because it was there and it's not there now. And I recognise that, uh, did he use the word religion or just faith? It's God who's remission and I believe that remission is permanent because of your faith. And I believe the remission is permanent because of your faith. I think the following Sunday, her husband came along who is sitting here in the front row. And in time, 
her daughters came along and both came to Christ. And I married one of them. <laughs> that was this church a long, long time back. Now, I know we don't see the power of God moving in the way we used to see. But I do want to say from Scripture, it is available. It is available. And it's something that as we, like a muscle, if you exercise a muscle, it becomes stronger. If you don't exercise a muscle, what happens to it? I don't know, what's the medical word? It atrophi atrophies? Atrophy, yeah. Atrophy sets in. And I think the challenge to my own heart is to exercise that muscle afresh and to just go on believing to see God do an amazing thing. So I'm going to pray. Now, Father, now I just wonder, Wendy, would you mind, Teresa, would, would you mind playing that song, There is Power in the Name of Jesus, that you were playing earlier? If that's okay. Now, Father, I do just commit our time into your hand. I do believe that you have made available to your children extraordinary power. It's not independent of you. It's not something that we can just say, I think I'll do this now with the power of God. It's something we do under you. It is under your direction. And if we ever move outside of that, that independence will get us into terrible, terrible trouble. But Father, there is a power made available to us. Power that raised Christ from the dead is made available to every single believer. I look to you by your spirit that, that we would be a people who grow not only in our knowledge and understanding of this, but our very experience of it. So work that in us in the precious name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. We're going to just close off singing that song that was being sung earlier. And then even as it's being sung, if you would like prayer, Please come to the front and then a, very, a little while into that, we're just going to close our time off. We've gone a little bit longer than, than usual. And then we'll have something to eat and drink. Please stand.